So in yesterday's podcast, I wanted to follow up on a comment regarding tiered armies in 40K. Now, this is still somewhat a thing. You'll occasionally hear about this in tournament circles or competitive play, or if you look at the rankings overall for a particular edition of 40K, there's this idea of tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. And in approaching that, In the current meta, 8th edition of 40K, the tiers are a little bit blurred. They're not as defining. They're not as um, polarizing as they were in other editions of 40K. But I believe, personally, if you're approaching the game from a competitive standpoint, they they still hold a little bit of weight in there. I won't say it's the deciding factor of what you're going to face, but there is some importance there. You know, it's, it's an attack point. It's a starting point. Um, in developing your strategy. So in every edition of 40K, we've got the various armies and the factions, but we have the rules first. Games Workshop determines these are the rules, these are the tweaks, and in every rule set, certain things are going to be stronger than others. It's just no rule set is balanced, and this is not a criticism. This is not saying the rules are flawed, but there's only so much you can do without a game master playing and and resolving things. An example would be if we go back in time, 4th edition 40K had, well, 3rd edition, all right, 3rd, end of 3rd, beginning of 4th, assault was very, very strong. You could assault, you could roll into other units, not many things were fearless, it was easy to sweeping advance and cut everything down, Um, you had ways to uh, deep strike in and assault, you had ways to scout in and assault, essentially you just take Gene Steelers show up 30 minutes later. The game is won. It was uh, overpowered. I mean, you saw Blood Angels just sweeping everything across there, right? You saw even non-assault armies assaulting. Um, One of the big things was playing Plague Marines, giving them a scout option, letting them to deploy uh, 12 to 18 inches away of other units at the start of the game. Start of the game, Plague Marines with Feel No Pain at the time and T5 could just basically soak up on everything. They were fearless. They weren't going anywhere. Uh, Then turn two, you auto-summon some demons. They drop in. They can assault off there, off the deep strike. And then your Plague Marines followed up. So that's an example of it being really, really strong. Now, in the current edition of 8th, assault is stronger. But in my opinion, and that's just my opinion, comments, yes or no, shooting is still key. Mobility, not as strong because the lists are very, very large in terms of model counts, and uh, for many of us, myself included, I don't think we play with the correct amount of terrain in 40K. And I think part of this is just you play in a club or a game environment. There's only so many tables. The terrain needs to be spread out because certainly, and I believe in this, we want everybody to be able to play their games. You know, if 10 people show up to play 40K, we're we're getting five games on. If 16 people show up, if 15 people show up, we're getting games on. I mean, there have been times where I've had a, a set gaming table and, you know, it's the foam cut into threes and we're getting ready to play and someone else shows up. And it's like, well, they're here. You got to play. You show up for 40K, you got to get a game in. So I've literally cut my table in half and be like, okay, here you go. Here's a, two panels for you. I'll, I'll just play on one. I mean, it's going to be a crazy lopsided game, but what the heck, right? So terrain is often spread thin with that. And that kind of, I think, affects um, mobility and that affects shooting. So the first thing we look at in terms of tiers, that's kind of the foundation. Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, Tier 4. Certain units in every faction, in every army, based on the rules alone, before we get into war gear and abilities and weapons, profiles, stats, the rules are just going to favor some things over others. Tier 1 armies tend to be bolstered by the rules, and that's what pulls them up to Tier 1. The second thing is, in every edition of 40K, and I won't say Games Workshop has gotten better about this. I think since they've upped their release schedule in terms of what they put out for the various factions, the various armies, it doesn't, doesn't sting, it doesn't hurt as much. But as they put stuff out, They want to sell models, so they make a certain unit really good. Or they make it a little bit over the top, or they make it a little bit under-costed. It's not as bad as it used to be, but it still exists a little bit. So the the 
units that are favored in this way, they're going to naturally gravitate towards tier one. So in this band of tier one armies, we have armies and lists that get a boost from the rules, get a boost from the unit abilities, and are the most up-to-date in terms of factions and rules. They're the easiest to win with. I won't say auto-win, but as a tabletop general, it makes things easier if you have vastly superior resources in terms of rules, models, abilities, war gear. It's going to pull things up tier one. Tier two armies are armies that have had enough updates. Half the units are favored by the rules. Half aren't. It's a little bit of a struggle. That's not to say now you can't make a mistake, but you make one or two mistakes against the tier one army just on the volume of dice and on the rules, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Tier three. These are armies that have not been updated or they got hit and you can gravitate and go up and down you know necrons faq uh, where are they now i think necrons are a tier two pushing towards tier three army and you know i'm a cron player i can say that i can look at that honestly faq changes things and it, it moves up and down so tier three armies are now you're struggling you go in against a tier one army you're already under the gun tremendously you go against a tier two army, you're in a lot of trouble on there. I won't say don't show up with these armies at a tournament, but you need to know what you're up against. And then finally, tier four. In the tier four group, these are things that just um, usually armies that sound good or in theory work really well in the narrative. Maybe you bring them to an apocalypse game or a fun game, but uh, stuff like hmm, Sisters, Death Watch, they just they don't just tra- they don't translate over into a mass combat tabletop game on there. So you're just outgunned everywhere on everything. You bring these to a tournament because they look really good, and you'll win favorite opponent or you'll win uh, best sportsman or something like that. But you're just you're just going to get rocked on there. They they don't translate to it. So where does your army fit in this? Now, for many many years, I played my Tyranids which I would say are a Tier 3 army at the time, tournament play, they did pretty well. Um, My Chaos list right now, I'd say, is lower Tier 2, which is my own fault. I consider Chaos Marines a Tier 2 army, but because I favor all assault, look, all my own choice, absolutely. On there, with Cornate Berserkers, Cornate Glory, that pulls it into there. Um, Other units that are out there, you got to see and decide where your army is. Now, we all want our armies to be the best, but look, be honest. Where is it? That now allows you to know in that moment, how are you going to play this game? How are you going to play this tournament? Are you going to go for the win? If I'm playing a tier three army against a tier one army, I won't say it's impossible to win. You never know about, but you kind of learn really fast. The beginning of turn one, in my opinion, tournament play, Beginning of turn one, you know the player personality. You know if they've got the goods to deliver. That, that's just being honest. That, that just absolutely is being honest on here. Because someone could clone a tier one list, paint very well, get it professionally painted. They show up at the table and you're like, wow, tier one army, tier one list, current meta, beautifully painted, display board, sound effects, t-shirt, everything. But then you find out like they just started playing 40K. You need to determine that really, really fast. If they have the goods, if they have the skills to back up that Tier 1 army, and I'm playing a Tier 3 or a Tier 2 army, maybe I I will never slow play, but now maybe, depending on the tournament format, I can get bonus points, I can pull a tie, maybe I'll lose, but I can pick up some additional bonus points on there. Um, Sometimes, if it's a big enough spread, I know that the best players will play against each other. This is if it's a smaller format. Then... I'll go for glory and let them wipe me out and get maximum, maximum battle points. This way, they'll be on the top three tables and the two giants will go head-to-head and self-destruct on each other and and kind of pull down to the midway. There's some other strategies to, um, to think about. You know where you're going in. Tournament prep. Tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. This is now where you play, you know, preparing for tournaments. This is where you play, and, and you know what? This I learned a lot of this in tournament play, but this could apply. You're part of a club, and you're like, look, I want to start winning. 
I want to start crushing. I just want to grind everyone into the ground. How do I do it? This is how you do it also. You can't learn every army. You can't learn every build. You can't learn every meta out there while focusing on your army too. You focus on your army first. That was the, the thrust of yesterday's podcast. And then you look and say, in the current Games Workshop universe of 40K right now, or whenever you're listening to this podcast, what are the tier one lists? That's what most cats are going to be playing. That's what they're going to be rolling with. You go online, you watch YouTube videos, you read blogs, you lurk on the forums, whatever digital supplement you have to take, and that is going to teach you how those armies work, how the ins and outs of why they're tier one, and now you can begin to bridge them, now you can begin to fight against them. And uh, this is what I see in competitive play a lot when people are making that bridge from narrative to competitive. You're learning your army, but you're like, what do I focus on? Don't worry about some obscure build. Don't worry about some Tier 4 army. Yeah, you know what? You might face that in the tournament and be completely unprepared. But you can't spread your resources so thin and learn everything in the amount of time. You prioritize it. Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, Tier 4. So I'm going to turn this over to the comments in a moment. And underneath this podcast is going to be a link to my blog with the current compiled stats um, for the various tiers on there. Do you agree with this assessment that we're still playing in tiers of armies? And again, they're not, they're not as rigid as they used to be, but I believe they still exist. And I believe it's still a useful developmental tool to get your 40K on. And what do you think, where do you think those armies fall within those brackets?